I joke to people sometimes that I now do a job my mother used to tell me off for. <laughs> and even now I go and prune her willow tree and she can't look, she can't watch. She just she just disappears somewhere else in the house. She can't, can't come out when I'm busy working. There was a particular hedge that I used to go past quite regularly when I used to cycle to school. A chap who cut the hedge and fashioned it to look like a locomotive. People years ago used to do an awful lot more of that, kind of quirky individuality. I suppose they didn't have a television, so it's something to do in the day. Well, they, they wouldn't have been sitting on their laptops watching us, would they? Well, they wouldn't, I, mean, I suppose. No, you're absolutely <laughs> right, just, they wouldn't. We're distracted them. I think we're, we're part of the problem here, Alan. <laughs> 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 Hello and welcome to Talking Dirty episode 19 over Addy Struston Old Vicarage. All wrapped up on a chilly autumnal day, it is Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and increasingly handsome horticulturalist. <laughs> and over in Cambridgeshire is the wonderful, laid back, lovely Thordis Maria <laughs> Sophia. Fredrickson, um, I have to say, I am wrapped up today, and I think I bet you, I, I bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow's wrapped up as well, <laughs> because it is incredibly damp. It's one of those days; it's not cold, but it is just so damp, and that damp makes you sort of feel kind of cold. So there's nothing like a snuggly snood to get your head into to make you feel <laughs> ooh, lovely. It's uh, it's been a misty, moisty few days, I'm sure, over in West Norfolk. Tamara Bridge, our award-winning garden designer, who's back on the podcast, uh, can testify to it being rather damp over there as well. It is, it is, but along with my snood, I think I have tassels, so it's all jolly here. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little extra detail we weren't expecting, tassels on the snood. <laughs> So, Tamara, I mean, it's, it's certainly garden design is at the forefront of people's minds at the moment. Chelsea, having skipped a year, is due to be back next year. 2020 has been the year of probably anybody who's had a garden spending twice, three times, four times as much time in it as ever before. Uh, it's kind of the year when we're all thinking about garden design. What's it like to be a garden designer at the moment? I think it's a bit frantic, to be honest. We have been so busy. It's great, but it just has shown how important the outdoor spaces are. People aren't being able to go away. And also they're really enjoying getting to know their garden and realising that they do enjoy spending time there. And almost it's opened up this whole new avenue for a lot of people um, that has proven to be, you know, quite significant this year. I know a lot of the landscapers have been flat out. They really are um, working super hard but of course we're all working within these funny times and things are so unpredictable so we're struggling with you know an increase in demand but then struggling to get materials and plan plan ahead so yeah it's been interesting I, I should think for a lot of people if this is the year that you've really embraced gardening there's there's a lot to take on board all at once particularly if you've got an average sized plot and you kind of want it to be everything maybe you want to try a bit of growing your own food you want somewhere to be able to sit and enjoy wherever the sun shines in your garden you want it to be nice in the evening in the morning it, 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 you kind of expect a lot of your garden I think you've just explain very well the um a lot of the briefs that I've been seeing this year and it's sometimes it's where you've suddenly just sort of discovered the garden and you've op you know I've had clients that for the first time watch Gardeners World for example and it's like this whole world that they didn't know existed and they literally want one of everything and it's been quite tough to not only for me kind of guide them on what would work but also try and discover what it is they actually like because quite often it's like anything um I'm a bit like it when I finally go clothes shopping and I walk in and I think oh I love that and I love that and I love that and I love that and then I get it home and think what was I doing <laughs> and have to take a lot of it back so it's it's making sure that what they want or think they want is actually going to be what they want long term um and it's and it is very difficult to manage expectations as well because I think they're so desperate or not, not desperate but kind of they're so keen to get the reward from doing something in their garden they kind of want it instantly and we all know you know unless you are at Chelsea Flower Show and the like garden isn't instant so um yeah it's just been different different and interesting I think the problem is with with, with lots and lots of people is the fact that they uh, especially if they've got a small garden in the country or they've just uh, said should we say they're new to gardening they have been I want to say skating above what's actually happening because they've been getting get, they you know, everybody gets up, they go to work or they do what they do. Um, and, you know, the very little time is actually spent in the garden because 
they're out doing stuff and now they can't be out doing stuff they suddenly come into the garden and that is where they find themselves being suddenly brought alive by the garden and Tamara's absolutely right about her clothes shopping habits they are atrocious I know that <laughs> <laughs> I let Alex do it normally <laughs> But the other the other thing is that, you know, people are going to say, I want one of those, one of those, one of those, and so on and so forth. And you have to let them, I think, um, an awful lot of people, I'm talking from my own personal experience, I have to let myself make mistakes. I don't often make mistakes now, and I shouldn't do after all this time. But, you know, occasionally you do, and you have to let somebody make that mistake, i.e. by the wrong plant, put that wrong plant, put that plant in the wrong place so it grows too quickly and it's too big, or whatever. Um, but all those mistakes can be rectified, and it's all part of the learning process, which I think is the great thing that fulfills us. And it is, it's that learning curve, and it's us allowing ourselves to become immersed in what we're enjoying. I, I certainly find one of my problems is I can never show the level of restraint that I think makes my- but You don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> the, the only time I managed this is I've got a very small front garden and I wanted to create a little gravel garden. And I went to buy my plants and I really tried to restrain myself and to buy multiples because we all know when you love plants, you tend to go to a nursery and go, oh, I'll have one of those and I'll have one of those. And of course it is possible to thread those through a planting scheme and make it all look joined up and fluid. But in the end, I bought you know a few grasses that were the same. I bought a few variegated euphorbias and it was the best planting scheme I'd ever done because I did show the only tiny smidgen of restraint I'm capable of. And then around it, I planted chaotically, but just having a little bit more continuity in my planting, that's the only time I've managed it. Since then, I've been planting all kinds of crazy things about it and I'm, I'm actually gradually losing what made the planting so good in the first place. But sometimes you have to restrict yourself a little bit and I am really bad at that. And I think as well though, I, I do love an analogy. It's a little, and this is probably awful to say, but it's a little bit like, dieting and if you're not that good at it like you know if you say dieting is like planting in a restrained manner you can do it for so long and then suddenly you've just got to just let yourself have the weekend off and just go for it and then <laughs> I think it does help you though find a level where you're comfortable at you know and actually having a uh, a magazine kind of level garden that looks wonderfully restrained is, is lovely for that moment you know that photographic moment of maybe having it for a few months and then there'll be another couple of months where you think I really miss those hellebores or the snowdrops or the whatever else was going on so you put those in and it does get a bit muddied and then like Alan was saying you can go back in and thin it back out again and it and it changes with your moods like I find that some years I want bright orange and purple in my garden in spring it just makes me joyful and it's uplifting when I get home and then by the time I get to summer I think I can't be doing with all those busy colors I'm so busy anyway I need like cool blues and purples and that's yeah I think that's what gardening can do though isn't it it just mimics you and helps you hey, find a balance yes I, I, I entirely agree I think yes it does and if you've got as much space as Alan you can do that in like all, all at the same time <laughs> but the reason I might have to like dig stuff out first <laughs> and and just with with small gardens I know that and with new gardeners when Val Bourne was on the podcast back on episode 11 she talked about um possibly younger but definitely newer gardeners wanting an area to give you just give 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 all the time all seasons and actually I think limiting your expectations when you're putting a planting scheme together is probably wise because although yes if you're very talented and if you do a bit of adding and subtracting you can get a border to give and give it's probably better to say this area is going to be fantastic at this time of year and this corner is going to be the the stunner at a different time of year it comes down to time and like you say expectations and i think if you've got all the time that, that you can spend on an area you can constantly be editing all the way through the year and it can be very successful and pops is a very good example of that where you can constantly be changing that up but if you need the garden to sort of really uh, not be quite so time consuming um then yes i think you do need to give yourself a bit of a break and just say that's fine that can go to bed for a few months and then come back out and and actually you really wait then i find that you really look forward to the change in seasons because you're re you've waited all year for that show um and then in my in my garden the dog normally stands on it straight away <laughs> hell of a ball gone 
thanks dogs but you know i think that is uh part of the joy that you can take out of having to wait if you if you feel limited by that um smaller plot of land or smaller time allocation i think time alloc allocation is the is the key i really do because there's a lovely lady who uh, doesn't live very far away from me and she's a very knowledgeable plants woman um, and uh, her aim was to actually get um, three seasons from the same little piece of garden, in, which, in other words, successional planting, I suppose. And she added to that by putting in, she used to raise an awful lot of peas, sweet peas and various other members of the Lathras family, lots of climbers such as Mina Labata um, and um, Morning Glories and all those kind of things. And she'd have them in pots and she'd She'd be going through the garden weeding and said, I'll just pop a pot of that in here. It will surprise me later. And I thought that was a lovely philosophy. It will surprise me later. And, you know, nine times out of ten it did, but it carried on that, that um, the feeling of continuity. Um, so the garden just kept on producing, it kept on giving. Um, and I think she was the master of that, but it is time consuming. You're absolutely right. Mr. and Mrs. Average, um, even if they're working from home, they probably haven't, they can't allocate themselves the time to, to, to be in their garden working the whole time. And why should they? Because they want to enjoy the open space. So I think one of the first things that you've got to actually do with your garden is decide, preferably if, you've got, if you can make two sitting spaces, one where you can just sit outside the back door. So you've got a table and chairs so you can take coffee or lunches outside when the weather's nice, because that's lovely because it increases your love of the garden and also your living space, you know, outside in the summer, inside in the winter. And the other is to have somewhere to sit in the garden proper. And don't worry about tidiness too much, I would say, because I think, you know, you can have an immaculate garden and if you've got children or you've got dogs, it's not gonna be immaculate very, very long. And do something that will interest children. I mean, make a log pile. It doesn't matter how small it is or how big it is. You know, you often see logs for sale um, at the, uh, I don't know, the garden centre or the farm shop, places like that, or even at somebody's gate, they're selling but, but, uh, sacks of logs. Just buy a couple and get the children to, to make log piles. You'd be surprised the amount of wildlife that it brings in. And don't forget that wonderful thing that we always have, and that's, that's water in a garden. I mean, water isn't essential. It doesn't have to be a dangerously deep pond, but what it can be is something like, you know, those plastic baby's baths that you get to sort of you know, dunk the baby in when, when you need to wash it in the morning, that kind of thing. Get one bucket. of those. Oh, what? Sorry? A bucket. A bucket. <laughs> well, an oblong shell, a shallow mean? bucket, shall we say. Um, just put, you know, put a, a, a little pond in and, and put some water weeds in it and some stones in it and you'll find that, you know, wildlife will come to you and it will make your whole garden so much more enjoyable, not just for you, but for the children. And it's also a great educational thing as well. It, it must be for you, Tamara, one of the recurring themes you get from people is they want their garden. When, when we talk about people wanting a garden to be everything, they're going to want it surely to be wildlife friendly as well in this day and age. Not always, um, but sometimes it's alluded to. And I think a lot of people as well, if they're at a point where they feel like they want a designer to come in and help them create the garden, they don't always know how to express what they want. So it's for, for a lot of my work is, is actually going in and talking to people and trying to sort of work out what it is that they do want and, and kind of work with them to almost then um, mould their expectations to what the site can offer and what maybe they're missing. So for example, I've had a client this year who just said, tomorrow I hate my garden. It's so scruffy, it's untidy, it drives me mad. And yet you and I would walk into the garden and it'd be beautiful. And I said, I really am, I can't see what you're seeing. You really need to try and work out what it is about that space that's making you feel stressed and work out what's making it feel untidy. And actually after a couple of hours walking around, it was, it was just simply the lines in the garden. So each part of the garden had been done at a different time, an extension had been put onto the house and it had just upset the balance of the garden slightly. And actually what it needed is like a, a simplification and an alignment of everything, which might not be that easy to explain now. Um, but once we've done two that- words. Just... Two words, fluidity and continuity. Yes, and I think, um, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of like creating um, a, a, a zen-like feeling in a space, which doesn't have to be Japanese, but it just is, um, it's upsetting if something's off balance. It's like having a wonky picture frame in your house. It drives me insane. So I felt like a lot of this year is kind of picking apart what 
people have in their gardens that are the equivalent of the wonky picture frame. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. I've That's been on my own a long time. <laughs> Lockdown. I mean, one always knows when the maid has dusted the pictures because she deliberately leaves them wonky so that you can see she's been at it. You need blue tack. That's what I do now. Blue tack them in. <laughs> um, and this year, have you found yourself going for, for certain plants when you're putting schemes together and you're trying to bring people zen and balance and fluidity and no wonky picture frames? What are you going for to maybe be manageable, give long flowering season, give structure, whatever it is? So I'm finding a lot of the plant groups that I'm moving towards to fit those um, priorities are very much your perennial grasses and then plants that work within that because people want, again, this year particularly, they want instant impact. And you can't, you know, people don't want to wait five years or 10 years for a shrub to get that big. So the grasses are great. They'll look, they'll look wonderful in year one you know, and only get better and better. And within that, then you get a lot more of the kind of more ephemeral flowering um, plants, the asters, the veronicas, sanguisorbas, all those sorts of things. And in a way, again, it depends on the client because sometimes it can put them off, but I call it an ornamental meadow. And that's really what we're creating. And that then brings in the wildlife. So again, we have that aspect. So you then bring noise and character and, and again, seasonality into the garden, just with the, with the birds and then the insects. And I can try and persuade people to um, not cut everything down as well. So we leave a lot of things through the winter. So whereas a traditional meadow you'd cut down in, say, September and it's gone with the more ornamental planting, you can leave it till February. So you have the crossover and that's working really well, because by that point, you've got the snowdrops and the bulbs and you've got other things coming along. And um, I'm finding that quite rewarding. And particularly in Norfolk, a lot of people have actually got big gardens and, you know, not everyone can plant up an acre of paddock in <laughs> you know, in, in, in a way that they might enjoy walking around someone else's garden. So it's a fairly economical way of planting too, because as um, you'll both know, you know, you can split split a two litre pot of perennial grass into little tiny pieces and, um, you know, cover a bigger area. So that's that's been very successful. And I think as well, it takes a bit of persuading. I think there's still a bit of stigma around grasses. Not everybody likes them. In fact, the majority of my clients really don't like them to start with. But um, I've had nothing but great feedback from them once they've actually lived with it and they can see it at this time of year still doing its job. It's interesting with grasses, isn't it? Because it's like they really divide people. You've got the, the crowd who instinctively dislike them, the people who like them because they're trendy, the people who dislike them because they're trendy. <laughs> And I, I just naturally, I love grasses. I think Alan and I occupy very different uh, of those groups. I think Alan and I are in different ones. I suspect, Alan, you're less keen because they've been overused and there's just all of the prairie planting has been so massive for so long. But I just, there's something about grasses and their sort of waftiness um, that I, yeah, I go I, for. I, I absolutely agree with you and you're absolutely right. I mean, I've always grown um, grasses all my life, um, it, you know, and there've been grasses, what I call grasses with present, presence. Um, if you take a miscanthus, like miscanthus variety condensatus, cosmopolitan, um, or her sister, which I can't remember the name of, cabaret. Um, they're both large striped, variegated white striped grasses. They have presence, they have, um, I mean, they're not wispy wafty things at ground level that look as if somebody's wig has blown off. That's the <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> That's the th that's the kind of thing that I don't necessarily like, but it I have shows to. Stand... The other side of my window. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, I think that I mean I'm not a fan of prairie planting. I did a prairie planting here at East Ruston. It was unsuccessful. It was a huge amount of work, um, and it, I planted it the first year. It was fabulous. The second year it was less fabulous. The third year I was thoroughly bored with it, and <laughs> therefore it became neglected. And so I got rid of it. Um, but I don't necessarily like that planting in great blocks now it's it's a bit like you know how i feel about heathers heathers should remain on a heath and if you go to a heathland and you look at it in october when the heathers are flowering it's, it's wonderful pur purpley pinky flowers and you've got the odd gnarled um, birch tree or the odd gnarled i'm thinking about bridgem heath near thetford for instance you look at that, it looks fabulous, but I wouldn't want it for a garden and I, neither would I want an American prairie. Um, and I think the problem is that 
English domestic gardening does not lend itself to a prairie landscape or vice versa. Um, and I've seen some of these plantings and they are, they're, I'm not saying they're not good because they are, but you get a, a barn that's been converted into a house and you get somebody like Tom Stuart Smith, who's our, one of our foremost garden designers in the country. He goes and does something wonderful with this kind of prairie planting, but that's what it is. It is not me as a gardener. And I think probably that's the problem. And I think problem with an awful lot of people as well, because, you know, where do you, if you've got a garden like that, where do you put the things that you love where do you put your cutting patch you know where do you put the vegetables i suppose you can put them around the back or something like that but i mean it's not it doesn't appeal to my sense of sense or sensibility i don't find it restful i don't want to be in amongst it i want to be in amongst flowers and plants that i love and if i sit there with a gin and tonic in the evening or whatever it is <laughs> i want something to look at which is rather more interesting than wispiness isn't this the great thing about gardening though it's like fashion it's like anything it's, it's well no, no, no two people thing. one one of the great things that christopher lord lloyd said years ago i remember is that no pe two people actually like the same things and thank goodness they don't <laughs> and nor do they all like each other which, thank goodness they don't because otherwise i'd be wearing a black jumper with red hearts on it today <laughs> i'm not i think you'd look rather nice in this actually alan oh, do I? get it off <laughs> But I mean, I, I love I love Steve Tenuissima. I mean, as as long as it doesn't look too much like it's escaped Donald Trump's head, um, I'm quite I'm quite happy <laughs> to have <laughs> quite happy to have. I'll never look at it the same again, though. <laughs> Hilarious. But no, I'm very happy with little wispy grasses. Also, I mean, it is again about plants for the places because. Um, my front garden, we've talked before about how the wind whips through and I'm kind of finding that a lot of things that are low do quite well because they don't get blown over and I'm sort of experimenting with what taller plants can cope um, and I haven't found any yet. So at the moment it's it's all quite low growing and um, and the grasses, my grasses go quite well in that. Um, it is interesting, isn't it? Because we were uh, um, Tamara was talking about, you know, that when you first design a garden to somebody and they, you know, you, they want some shrubs, shall we say, let's just say some roses. Look, a rose bush from planting to getting a decent sized rose bush really is three years. Um, and most people don't want to wait for that. So I think, and, and also I was thinking when you were talking to our, uh, as well, that um, you as a garden designer, really, you need to have more than just a six month relationship with your garden owner, because you need, this needs to be an ongoing um, relationship like a damn good hairdresser because you know your garden is not going to mature in one season it's going to take five years at the very least and then you're going you know you and your client because we're all growing and changing the whole time we're all going to sort of veer slightly to the left or slightly to the right and have extra and extraordinary ideas um, and you want to do something else but you you as a garden designer have got to guide your client so I mean you what Goodness me, I don't envy your task. You've got to be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, um, my favourite aunt, <laughs> you name it. <laughs> I also think what's really hard about it is you've got to be really malleable because I would just want to enforce my tastes on everybody. And I would want to be able to say, well, in my garden, what I loved when I was going for instant impact is how quickly things like verbena grew. And I've got this, is it Euphorbia mellifera? which actually grows really quickly and is a wonderful it, 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 that, that is exactly, you're absolutely, you hit the nail on the head. There's an advertisement on television for tooth, for teeth, um, tooth brushing <laughs> stuff, you know, paste. <laughs> and this woman, this woman, she actually says, well, this is the one that I actually use myself. And I said to Graham the other night, I said, that's one good reason not to use it. <laughs> It's, it, I think it's awful when people say that. Well, actually, this is what I do. Well, I don't want what you do. I want you to work out what I want to do. Yeah, and I just want to give them what I like. <laughs> it's interesting, though, because when you go to, uh, again, uh, I'm just thinking of a fairly straightforward showcase, but somewhere like a, an RHS flower show where you've got lots of designers work all lined up next to each other. It's a really good... Um, way of explaining how different us as designers can be and how personal it is. And so I think as much as I agree with what Alan's saying, and I do definitely always want to create a garden for the client, there comes a point where I say, actually, I'm not the right designer for you. If you want, you know, brutalist, um, wild realism, go to James Basson, because he's 
king at that you know that's what he specializes in if you want yeah. roses and romance you'd go to joe thompson so it's it's kind of you know the the portfolio that we portray to our clients is is a reflection of our interpretation of what clients want so there does come a point i think and as i get older and more more weathered um i get stronger at saying and being honest with clients and saying actually i don't think um that that's that i'm the right person for you but equally some of my most interesting work that i've done is for clients that have asked for something that's slightly outside of my comfort zone and i've thought okay i, I want to give this a go and it's pushed me to think how i can interpret that in my own way and so it's that's where i get the joy from my work as well is, is that challenge but there's a fine line because <laughs> i'm not going to be doing you know really modern contemporary gardens uh, that are hard landscaping based because I don't know enough about it but yeah it's it's um it's a journey through which I think Alan as you as you uh, mentioned is more about client psychology than anything else I think it is yeah I think it is and, it's about, and the one great thing of course is also is friendship um and the the other the other thing I know I keep Chris uh, um, talking about Christopher Lloyd but he once told Graham and I that we were very lucky, as you know, Graham and I have debates in the garden occasionally. And I mean, it sounds like we're going to pull each other's head off. We haven't yet. Um, but that's what it sounds like to ordinary people, because we do discuss things at rather high volume. However, that, ser that um, little series of high volume bat and ball usually resolves the situation. And Christo once said how lucky we, were, we are to have it. We were to have it before Fergus Garrett went to, to Great Dexter, so many years ago, um, and he had exactly the same relationship with Fergus Garrett. I mean, they, they discussed what was happening at Great Dexter. And I think this is what you must have with your clients, um, Tamara, because it is very difficult to think of these things on your own. You need input from somebody else. And mm. that input has to be somebody that knows you sufficiently well. And that's what you probably have to build up with your client, you know, to get to that kind of relationship, um, to get a satisfactory outcome for both parties. Absolutely. And, and quite often as well, there's two parties. So it could be that one member of the household has come to me and it's their project. But actually, you know, the other person of the household has to still live there and enjoy the garden. And for <laughs> me, I have, to, I have to generally manage the expectations of both. And, and from, from my point of view, get both people on board, whether they want to or not, because inevitably what I find is as soon as we start building the garden everybody's interest and has an opinion so it's much better to have everyone on board while it's still on paper than it is uh while we're actually on site um and that can be quite interesting and I find now again as of the years have gone on I have to be quite careful because I can read a situation quite quickly but I have to warm the clients up to that and build them up to me uh doing what I need to do and not just walk in and go, right, well, that's going and that's going. And don't worry about that. I'll sort, you know, I'll sort the husband out later. <laughs> and, you know, because they don't take kindly to that. Um, <clears throat> but quite often. I don't that... know. I don't know. I think you have a certain charm. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to take, I have to take things a bit slower to, to kind of just gear them up. But um, it's definitely better when everybody's on board. <laughs> Now, of course, one of the joys of Talking Dirty is a spot of show and tell, which can be all kinds of things. Last week, your husband, Alexander Laver, brought along one of his favourite books. What are you going to share with us, Tamara? Well, I think um, I'm going to try and show you my aquarium, which sounds a bit off topic, but I think um, it's quite on topic in a way because um, I got into doing aquascaping last year a little bit because it's just an excuse to buy more plants, really. And um, I know nothing about it. So it's been really tricky to get these plants to grow because they need different requirements. There's no soil that, you know, they need carbon dioxide and, and artificial light. And so um, it's been a lot of trial and error. And I'm on version two and I'm just about to go on to version three because I don't like it. Um, but a lot of the plants are so interesting and I'm loving um learning about it and um i've got very excited because what i'm going to try next is to not only have underwater plants but i'm going to have more of a sort of terranium top part to it and maybe a little waterfall you know who knows so i'm going to try and show you now i'm going to have to get up <laughs> if this doesn't work i can send you a video it's also a good excuse for more pets because i've now got fish <laughs> so this is now my office. And this is my little aquascape. Oh, look. Look at them all. 
So we've got lily, we've got, and then I'll have to give you the names of everything, but we've got plants that need soil, plants that just grow on rocks, we've got pennywort, and there's so much things like ranunculus that we kind of have in the garden that I was like, oh, I can put it under water. And then I have another one. <laughs> My, I don't know if this one will show up. And this one's got no filter, but you can see my artificial light. It's not very pretty. <laughs> so this is what I've been doing all year. It's, it's very, it's very, very boring. They're very calming. To go back to this idea of creating Zen, they're the sort yeah. of thing you can get lost in and you can buy more plants. So that's a good thing and experiment with different plants. And yeah, we see a lot of terrariums, but the whole aquascaping thing, perhaps because it does require a bit more investment um, and knowledge, you don't see as much of. Maybe, but I mean, in a way I started off very low tech because it's expensive. If you, you know, if you go right up to the, you know, aquascape kind of top of the market, it's ridiculous. You could buy a small car. Um, <laughs> So I had just a really, that really little tiny tank. It's just a glass tank with no filter. Um, it's got a little heater in it now because it's freezing in here. Um, and there's no plant food that goes in. There's no carbon dioxide that goes in. So it was experimenting with the plants that could cope with that. And actually that's been the most successful. If you start introducing food and carbon dioxide and filters, suddenly everything goes crazy and you get algae. I get, I'm very good at growing algae. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there's so many plants and a lot of them are um, from Brazil. So the ones I'm growing are more from Brazil and they flower and they do all they do all the exciting things that our garden plants do. But it's year round. You don't get rained on and you can do it in a tiny little space. So I'm, I'm a bit hooked on that at the moment. I love the terminology, actually. I mean, when I was a, when I was a child, you had a, you had an aquarium. No. <laughs> what did you call it? Something landscape? Aquascaping. Aqua landscape. Well, it rather reminds <laughs> me of the alternative to, to crazy paving, which was terribly fashionable 60 or 70 years ago as, a, as, a, as garden paving because it used up all the slabs that got broken up at the, at the suppliers and he would sell them off very cheaply. And I've seen it used in modern gardening and it's called alternative paving. <laughs> Who is it? I still call it crazy paving. <laughs> all I would say to your wonderful aquarium, aqua sculpt, whatever you called it, <laughs> is that life is a series of compromises. Remember that. <laughs> well, there's been no compromise on version three. <laughs> we'll be coming. I'll tell you one thing I, one thing I could see. When, when, you, when we started this conversation, I wondered where on earth it was going. And I, I envisaged that there would be a room divider in <clears throat> Tamara's uh, office there, which would be... Um, probably about uh, 60 centimetres wide and it'd be go from floor to ceiling and we'd be watching this bubbling ribbons of kelp <laughs> up through this lovely water. And that's what I sort of thought of and I didn't think of an aquarium. Is that version four? Yeah, yeah I was going to say I've got a room in the office that we haven't yet utilised and I did say to suggest to Alex the other day could that be my new aquarium room and he didn't say no I think he's biding his time, but there is always options because I also have discovered that you can grow coral and they don't harvest. Well, I'm sure some people do, but you don't buy it from the wild. Obviously they grow it in cultivate. They cultivate it in. Coral the wild. houses. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but they're just stunning. And, but that's like a whole new level of excitement, but I thought growing corals would be quite good. But with my aquascaping, and I will shush about it in a minute, I am really excited about growing moss because there's so many fascinating varieties of moss and that's what I'm going to do. So if you don't hear from me for six months, it's because I'm growing moss. A regular person that comes to the garden here is obsessed with lichen or lichen. And I mean, the varying kinds of lichen there are, I mean, she photographs them with this huge, great lens and you get this fantastic structural photographs from them. I mean, it is, it is, it's a whole new world out there. It's one of those things that fascinates me because it's a bit like growing lithrops or living stones. These sort of people, they, they, they focus on something and it's, it's the minutiae of life. This yes. tiny, tiny little world. I mean, and to them, it's absolutely full of jam packed with interest. And personally, I mean, you can keep your mask. I'll keep. I'll, I'll go with grasses. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Alan. We won't be competing over that, will we? But no. I used to grow lithops as a child. I used to grow Venus flytraps as a child. And this year is a year of me reliving my childhood. I'm just like loving it. You're too young to do that yet. 
Of course, the added, the added bonus with, um, with Lythrops is they look like little bottoms. And who doesn't yes, they want do. to know that? Yes, they do. <laughs> Control bottoms. Bums in the sand. <laughs> well, from show and tell and little bottoms to Flomo, I will get the ball rolling on Flomo with um, something I've actually, this is something I messaged to Alan um, for some advice because Jane Ann Walton, who was on this podcast a few weeks back, her Instagram is just full of Flomo. If you go and scroll through that, you're going to want to grow everything. But I spotted in the edge of a bouquet of flowers this gorgeous little Nicotiana. And, um, and so I messaged away, what is that Nicotiana? I want to grow it. And of course, typically, it's self-seeded. So I, she thinks it started life as Nicotiana Tinkerbell, but this is now probably a few generations down the self-seeded uh, route. So it looks a bit different it's a bit unique it's not quite tinkerbell but i think therefore if i get tinkerbell maybe i will also get little self-seeded children of tinkerbell which may end up being as beautiful as jane ann walton so nicotiana tinkerbell is on my list i mean nicotianas are wonderful so there should always be more you, will, you will get variation because i've got a, a nicotiana that's blooming near my potting shed um it's it was a late self-sown hybrid of some sort. I think one of its parents is, is Nicotiana mutabilis, which opens up pink and then gradually fades to white. Um, but it's a big plant. It's about one and a half meters tall. But this one is entirely white flowers, white and green. Now, there's two reasons, I think, for that. One is that it might be due to, due to lower light levels and to lower temperatures. So they're the two reasons I think it might not have any pink in it. So it could be Nicotiana mutabilis, but it's, it's mu it has mutated into something else because of the temperature and the light levels. Um, or maybe it hasn't. I don't know. It's a mystery. It's interesting. <laughs> Tomorrow, what's your flomo? Uh, following from a theme, I've been getting a bit obsessed with bladder warts and sundew fly traps. It's your favourite, Alan. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so I have um, sort of found a website called what's it called? HD Carnivorous Plants, and they have just the most fantastic range. And again, some of these are from Brazil. And I'm looking at you now. Uh, Utricularia parthenopipes. Very lovely. Oh, ooh, hello. Exactly, Thordies. <laughs> and um, and then I think there's a <laughs> another sundew fly trap, um, which is our native one that I'm kind of just trying to work out if I can grow those um within my aquarium because they need rainwater and acidic water and it might upset my fish. So um, if I can't, I think I might just try and grow them in like a little saucer. So have like a minute Japanese bog garden type thing, um, but with these amazing little plants. So, yeah, I'm excited. Oh, wow. Um, I don't think people, well, I'm sure lots of people realise, but not everyone realises we have got native sundew sort of fly trap plants in the UK. Yeah, they're beautiful little things and um, they're a bit quirky and a bit odd but you know this new fashion for miniature gardens and using these tiny miniature um, plants shows how you can grow them and they can be just such beautiful stylish centerpieces to your house um, in a way that perhaps when I was growing them as a child they weren't they were like dollops on the windowsill <laughs> <laughs> Not so good. Um, and yeah I, I, it's just it's a, a thing that you can play with I think on a small scale so it's fun. Do you know what? I bought Alan a little terrarium uh, a couple of years ago that I think you were quite puzzled by. Maybe I should go next level and buy you an aquascape. No, it does work. <laughs> I mean, my, the, that, little, that little pot is on my kitchen windowsill, which faces, it faces east, so it gets the early morning sun and then no more. Um, and I was looking at it the other day, and I have really got now to divide it all because it's grown so well. Oh. It is positive. I mean, the, the landscaping has gone to put kaput or whatever you call it um, because it is now a veritable forest of all these lovely coloured leaves and everything oh. so it is growing tremendously well and yet yeah, maybe I need a bigger one I don't know however I'll just say it's about in, insectivorous plants um, I understand the fascination of them entirely um, but I have <laughs> but no... you hate them <laughs> yeah well no I don't hate them I don't know that's wrong but I just have no wish to grow something like a saracenia that looks like somebody's internal organs there's something wrong with them However, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> now, my Flomo, if I may be so bold, my Flomo is much more down to earth. And you could say dead boring in a way, but I was reading 
um, a piece by Arnie Maynard, and you will know who Arnie Maynard is, both of you, but I mean, he's a, one of my favorite garden designers anyway. He's very low key, um, and he comes up with occasionally some cracking ideas. And I mean, he's designed quite a few gardens in Norfolk um, that we can all go and look at. Um, but he was talking about naturalizing a lily, and it was Lilium pyrenaceum. Um, and this lily naturalizes quite well at the edge of woodland in light turf, um, uh, sparse grass, in other words. Um, and I thought, oh, that would be rather nice, to, you know, going with the kind of nature theme and all the rest of it. So I went to my, um, my little um, mine of information where I can buy lily bulbs from at um, very good prices. And the cheapest I could find uh, Lillian Pyronaceum uh, per bulb was about seven pounds a bulb. And I thought, well, considering that you need 30 to 50 to naturalize to look, you know, wild, that's quite a lot of money. And so my flomo is to get Lillian Pyronaceum. And I think probably the only way that I'm going to get it um, is to grow it from seed. Um, and I know quite a lot of people that are good at growing plants from seed. And I'm going to start by asking. And in actual fact, he's on my list to ring this morning because he grows an awful lot of plants for me. I'm going to ask him if he'll grow some Lillian Pyronaceum, not to flowering size, because I don't want to wait three years, <laughs> just to get them going so I can actually establish a large colony. So that's and, my fly. That, Lillian Pyronaceum. I think that's an excellent idea. More growing things from seed, because as we've said before, time goes so quickly that if, if money is your main problem, if money is the main thing that's stopping you from having things, just get the seed start earlier yeah. and wait a bit longer if you can yeah good idea this has been an unexpected journey through aquascaping and mosses and garden design it's really encompassed indoors outdoors grass ladder works to crazy paving <laughs> <laughs> who could ask for anything more tomorrow who could ask for anything more <laughs> jazz hands <laughs> Oh, Tamara, thank you very much. It's lovely to see you again. Go put the fire on and get warm before you lose all the circulation in your hands or something. I will do. Lovely to see you both. All Mwah. the best. Bye. Bye bye. Hello. Aloha. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. <laughs> you didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> Doggy doggy. <laughs> we love them. <laughs> so cute. Hey.